tonight. It's supposed to be a normal day. Two gentlemen pull up in a motorcycle, pulls out a nine millimeter. Next thing I know, I'm hunched over with four shots to the torso at point blank range. They told me he just have 25% of life. We don't guarantee that he will survive. An ABC 27 special presentation. The orthodox called me up. And he said, I don't want to alarm you, but we saw something on Clara's film. They told me that there was something on my head that the doctors had to get removed. Cutting Edge, sponsored by Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Good evening, I'm Deborah Pinkerton. 3D printing, bioprinting, bone and skin regeneration. It sounds like a futuristic science fiction movie, but they are real, not fantasy. How are doctors using these new technologies today? You'll find out tonight. And if you have questions at home, Christina Butler is here to tell you how to get them answered. Christina. Thanks, Deborah. Specialists from Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center are in the ABC 27 call center to answer your questions until 8 o'clock. Call the number on the bottom of the screen or you can email your question during the show to questions at abc27.com. Dr. Ryan Yuza and Dr. Cassie Sontag will answer your emails throughout tonight's show. All calls and emails are confidential. And I'll be back in just a few minutes to share some of those questions with you. Deborah. Thanks, Christina. Here to tell us about some of the exciting and unique services offered by Penn State Health, Dr. Randy Halleck, the Chief of Minimally Invasive Surgery and also the Vice Chair for Technology and Innovation in the Department of Surgery. Welcome, Dr. Halleck. Thanks, Deborah. Why don't you tell us about some of the different things that are taking place there, these innovative procedures <coughs> at the Med Center? Well, the Med Center, uh, the Hershey Medical Center, is part of Penn State University, where Penn State Health. There are a, a myriad of innovations and unique things that we're doing, both in treating patients in the clinic and things we're doing in research. And we're going to hear a, about a couple of those things tonight. We're going to emphasize uh, what we're doing in 3D printing, 3D imaging, and how we're using that to treat, uh, treat patients uh, for um, ideal cosmetic uh, reconstruction. And you have a couple of examples to tell us about. We do. There are two incredible stories about how we're treating patients and two great examples of that. One is uh, complex abdominal wall hernia reconstruction uh, by Dr. Eric Pauli. Um, hernias are common. Uh, hernia surgery is common, but these very difficult complex hernias is something that uh, our team specializes in. We're also going to hear about cranial reconstruction, a young girl who had a lesion removed from her skull, and again, using these 3D printing techniques, 3D imaging techniques, finding a solution that's going to work for her long term. Okay, Dr. Halleck, thank you so much for getting us started, and as you mentioned, we will share some of those stories with you later in the show. But first, why don't we check in with Christina Butler in the ABC 27 call center to see what viewer questions have come in so far. Christina. Hi again, Deborah. And the phones are already busy over here. Remember, you can call 717 346 3333. And here to answer our first viewer question tonight is Dr. Eric Pauli. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Let's get right to this question. This viewer asks With the changes in technology, are doctors looking for new ways to get images instead of an x ray since that exposes us to radiation? Absolutely. We use lots of different types of imaging modality medically, including ultrasound and MRI, which are completely radiation free. But the way x rays are captured nowadays, there's much less radiation dosing. So even with a modern CAT scan, the amount of radiation that a patient is exposed to is significantly less than even five or ten years ago. Okay, that's good information. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Pauli. And remember, if you have a question for a specialist, you can call in. You can also email your questions to questions at abc27.com. Deborah, back to you. Thanks, Christina. Later in the show, a visit to the orthodontist led to some unexpected news for Clara Phillips. X-rays showed a lesion in her skull. Doctors used 3D printing to replace the bone. But up next, Sergio Velez was shot five times while living in the Dominican Republic. How did the Med Center help him? You will find out right after this break. Stay with us. You're watching Cutting Edge on ABC 27. Sponsored by Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Welcome back. A Hazleton man went through the unthinkable while living in the Dominican Republic. Here's Sergio Velez's journey. 
Sergio Velez and his wife Jamie opened Cutie Cut Salon while living in the Dominican Republic. They vividly remember the morning of October 15, 2014, a day that changed everything. It was um, extremely unexpected. It's supposed to be a normal day, dropping the wife off to open the salon and me go to work, and it just turned into utter mayhem. Two gentlemen uh, pull up in a motorcycle. The gentleman pulls out a nine millimeter, walks past my wife, uh, cocks back, and just starts pointing, screaming, give me the money. They used the guns and everything. I get scared, I start running. We were like in a little plaza. So I ran into the plaza, I started knocking people and calling and screaming like crazy. My fight or flight said fight, not flight. And I saw my husband fighting with the guy. And then I started like screaming. Was able to disarm him momentarily. Throughout the scuffle, somehow he ended up on the floor next to the weapon again. And next thing I know, I'm hunched over uh, with four shots to the torso at point blank range and they're taken off. So then I saw him on the floor and my only reaction was just pick him up, put him in my car and take him to the hospital. And that's what Jamie did. She drove her husband, riddled with gunshot wounds, to the hospital. There she didn't receive very good news. The first thing that they told me is just to pray because they told me he just have 25% of life, then we don't guarantee that he will survive. I know it was a hard moment, but I know he will make it. I don't know, it was something just inside of me that doesn't let me give up. Doctors performed 14 surgeries on Sergio while in the Dominican Republic. Some of the shots went through my stomach, my perforated my, uh, slightly my stomach, my intestines, and uh, destroyed like two thirds of my liver. Every two days, they were cleaning him up inside, the intestines and everything. After being in a coma for weeks, Sergio finally woke up. For me, it was very, very exciting moment because for me, it was like, I knew I, you, you was wake up. But when he saw me, he started crying, and I was happy. I was giving thanks to God. Two months after the shooting, Sergio was able to leave the hospital and return to the States. He then developed a hernia from the surgeries and experienced gallbladder problems. Doctors referred Sergio to Hershey Medical Center. In Sergio's case, he had a surgical incision created in an emergency circumstance where there was contamination as a result of injuries to the intestine. And when you put an emergency surgery together with contamination, we know that about 25% of people in those circumstances will develop a gap in the abdominal wall muscles, which is what a hernia is. It inhibited just about every aspect of life. I mean, like standing up, moving around, so if I jumped a little bit, when I came back down, it felt like my, from the, my diaphragm down, everything was just trying to gush out through the weakest point. And I bought him like a cane for he can walk a little bit straight. But anyways, it was kind of hard for him. He was referred to me primarily to have his gallbladder taken out, but in the setting of, I also need a complex abdominal wall uh, hernia repair at the same time. He explained things in a sense that were um, direct, very concise, but no fear. These are Sergio's uh, CT scans. This is Sergio's right-sided six-pack muscle here, and here's the left-hand side, and so everything in the middle of that uh, is, a, is a large gap. His hernia was about 15 centimeters wide, and it went all the way from his breastbone all the way down to his pubic bone. So it was the entire length of his abdominal wall was involved uh, in the hernia. The, the way he explained it was that he's gonna remove the gallbladder, uh, and almost immediately after taking the gallbladder out, th uh, clean the area and just put the, um, the mesh, which pretty much goes down that area. For me, it was, you know, like another opportunity another moment, another hope, another, I see like a, a little light on my dark space. 
So Sergio's operation is called a posterior component separation uh, or a TAR operation. We divide the abdominal wall into layers. We separate the back layer of the abdominal wall apart. We put a layer of the patient back together. We put the mesh in place. He has a piece of mesh that is one square foot in dimension and it covers him from above his breastbone down to the pubic bone and it goes all the way from side to side on him. More than 10 hours in surgery, a lot of waiting and praying for the family. It was a long process, but he's, he will be good. He told me everything is fine. And I just cried and hugged him and I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. So much thanks for a procedure that really made a difference. I feel good for the most part. You know, I, I can work, I can be active. I can be silly with the kids and not have to worry about it too much. It's so much better than before. He can be with us, like always, like riding bikes. He likes his bike. He's like normal now. It's made all the difference, like the difference between me having to rely on Social Security and me being able to work and support my family. And that pretty much says it all. It's been two years since the surgery, and as you can see, Sergio is really doing well. Now joining us is Sergio's surgeon, Dr. Eric Pauli, the director of endoscopic surgery at the Med Center. What a huge difference you made in his life. From a guy who was walking with a cane to a guy who works full time and delivers packages for a living. Yeah, he improved a lot. Talk to us about what type of hernia surgery he had and why is it so unique? Well, so Sergio had an incisional hernia uh, as the result of his multiple operations in the Dominican Republic. What made his surgery unique is the fact that he had a large hernia on a small frame. Uh, he had had 14 other operations and the amount of scar tissue he had was really quite dramatic. And he needed his gallbladder out at the same time, so we were dealing with some bacteria from the gallbladder part of the operation as well. And with hernia operations, are there any physical limitations? Uh, after the surgery, we do put limitations on what people are allowed to do, but one of the reasons we specialize and perform these complex abdominal reconstructions is so that patients can get back to their regular activities. So when folks are fully recovered, like Sergio, if they want to ride a bike or have a job that requires lifting, we want them to do that. That's why we spend the time putting them back together. And we could see that he is living his life again. Indeed. Talk to us about the mesh repair. Is that something that you use in every hernia surgery? So yeah, so mesh is necessary for some hernia repairs, but not all of them. Um, mesh comes in a variety of sizes and shapes and, and materials. This is a piece of permanent plastic mesh, which is designed to be there forever. And this is the kind that Sergio actually has in him. We also have meshes that are made of biologic materials and meshes that are designed to dissolve over the course of time. Not every mesh is right for every patient, and part of our job as specialists is to know what operation, what mesh, and at what time for the patient. So not every patient is ready for surgery when we first meet them. Hernia surgeries are common. Lots of surgeons fix them. Why does Hershey Medical Center specialize in this procedure? Well, what we specialize in mostly is a team approach to this. Um, it's a formula for success. We know that some patients aren't ready for their operation when we first meet them and we refer them, for example, to our weight loss surgery clinic to help them lose weight, sometimes with an operation, a surgical weight loss operation. Um, we know that we do different techniques. Uh, we specialize in mesh constructs, so we know, again, the right mesh for the right patient at the right time. And why is it important, as you mentioned, as far as losing weight before hernia surgery? I know we talked earlier about even smoking, stopping smoking. Why is that important? Yeah, both of those things, smoking and uh, obesity, we know are risk factors for wound problems after hernia repair, for mesh infections, and ultimately for recurrent hernias. And so our policy is that we, we take care of people when it's the right time. If that means smoking cessation for the type of hernia that patient has, then we help our patients get to that point. And with these new innovative procedures, what are, what's the likelihood of the hernia coming back? So with the type of operation that Sergio got, uh, a three to five percent chance of getting a hernia back in the long term, which is really quite good. Okay, lots of really good information. Thank you, Dr. Pollack, for joining us. And let's check back in with Christina in the ABC 27 call center. Hi, Christina. Hi again, Deborah. There are still a few minutes to get your calls in. You can call 717-346-3333. The phone lines are open until 8 o'clock. And if the phone lines are busy, you can also email your question during the show to questions at abc27.com. We have another viewer question now, and here, here to answer that is Dr. Randy Hollick. And here is this question. They write, I've heard the term robotic surgery. How does this work, and what is the advantage for the patient? 
Robotic surgery is a, term, is a variation on minimally invasive surgery. Again, small incisions, but a, a, a surgeon is sitting at a console where a computer is helping to guide the instruments. So it results in better imaging um, and a little bit more precision. It's not right for every operation, but there are certain instances where it works very well. At Penn State Health, we have a very robust, very broad robotic surgery program. We have a robotic surgery in a lot of different specialties, and in fact, we have an, uh, a, a robotics program in otolaryngology, where is, it is only uh, one or two programs in the nation of okay. that type. Okay, and here's our next viewer question. I have a friend who has advanced cancer throughout the abdomen. Is there some type of heated chemotherapy surgery that can help? Yes, that's an, an unfortunate situation when the cancer is spread uh, throughout the abdomen. And uh, there is an option, again, not being offered in a lot of centers throughout the, the nation, but it is offered at uh, the Hershey Medical Center. And it's uh, a technique called HIPEC, uh, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, where the operation is done, sometimes tumor is removed, and very high temperature chemotherapy is delivered right, right at the tumor. Again, not for everybody in selected patients, but it can be a benefit to a few patients. Okay, worth investigating yes, if it is. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Hollick. And thank you also to the specialists who have been here tonight answering our viewer questions. And again, they will be here until 8 o'clock this evening. Deborah, back to you. Thanks, Christina. A Lackawanna County girl and her parents never expected to be making two hour trips to Hershey to see doctors at the medical center, but that's what happened last fall. Here's Clara Phillips journey. Dance, cheerleading, music, 11 year old Clara Phillips does it all, but a visit to the orthodontist forced her to take a break. Her parents received some unexpected news. She was just having x-rays, it was a pan x-ray of her jaw and face, and um, that's just something typical that they do for anybody that's going to start getting braces. The orthodontist called me up, and I assumed it was just a normal call, and, and he said, I don't want to alarm you, but we saw something on Clara's film that needs some follow-up treatment. And he said, your pediatrician, I already had a conversation with her, she will be calling you shortly. Then David spoke to the pediatrician. And I said something to the effect, you know, can, can you give me any more information? Because, you know, I, I know my next call is to Beverly and she needs more information. So he said, well, you know, there, there was a, a, a spot or an anomaly, I think might have been what she called it, you know, up on the top of the head that we just need to look more into. So I called Beverly real quick. I think she was on her way home from work. I could tell that by his tone that something had happened. And he said, before I start, he goes, I know I heard less than 10% of what I'm about to tell you. Told her, you know, the, the orthodontist called, uh, the pediatrician called, um, there's something going on and we need to get follow-up x-rays. So our first process was to just get a repeat film x-ray. Um, unfortunately, the repeat film x-ray um, did verify that there was something. Um, they called it the right parietal part of her brain, so right up in here. And uh, they didn't know if it was brain or if it was skull. They couldn't really tell by that and that she would need to have further studies. News that wasn't easy for Beverly and David to tell their young daughter. They told me that I had, like, that there was something on my head that the doctors had to get removed. I have a medical background, but I was not able in any way, shape, or form to look up anything about this. I'm sorry. Two o'clock in the morning when you start to think about, after thinking about this over and over again, you know, what is this, what's going on? It's pretty scary. Doctors referred Clara and her family to Hershey Medical Center. I told them I thought it was some type of skull mass lesion, uh, something that was eroding the skull from inside the bone, and that uh, the majority of those lesions are benign. He said, I've seen it before, uh, we're gonna deal with this, uh, we're gonna get taken care of. We told them that we felt we needed to excise the affected area of bone to prevent it from spreading and creating a larger defect, and that we would plan to close that. We felt the best option for her, given the size and location of the defect, was uh, implant. So it's a special type of plastic implant that's made by one of our companies that we work with. It is custom fitted to the patients. Since it was my first surgery, I felt a little like, I just didn't really want to have the surgery. I just didn't want any of that to happen in the first place. But they did say that everything would be okay. 
Doctors used a navigation system like a GPS on Clara's head to make sure they removed the entire lesion. It was very important in this case because even with the bone exposed, you couldn't tell exactly where the margins of the lesion were because it wasn't visible from the exterior of the skull. Once we're assured that it's completely out, then my job is to reconstruct the, the skull to essentially protect the brain. Her implant was roughly about five centimeters by five centimeters, and it was up on the curve of the skull. We use plates and screws that are made of a titanium alloy, and these are less than a millimeter thick. So when you put these on, the implant stays in very rigid, stable position, and you would not be able to feel this when you have the scalp closed over top of it. She went in at 7.30 it was when we said goodbye to her, and right about 10.30 was when Dr. Sampson, Dr. Iantoski came down to the waiting room to give us the highly favorable news that everything was as expected and that she did really good. Her scar looks fantastic. You're not even gonna be able to see where it happened. Um, she did great through the whole thing. There was minimal blood loss. Moments later, they were able to watch Clara wake up. She was sleeping like a baby. And after about 15 minutes, you know, I, I see a big... I see a big blue eye open up. Great feeling. When I saw them, I was actually really happy to see them because I didn't like surgery a lot. I just wanted to go home, but I still had to stay there another night. Clara spent one night in the hospital and returned to school days later. The fact that a surgical procedure could correct this and that she didn't need to go through anything else, no radiation, no nothing, nothing that altered her in any way, shape or form, nothing, was huge, it was huge for us. I feel glad and relieved that no one can see it because it'd be kind of weird to just walk around school and people noticing that I have scars right there. Clara, she's doing good. The process has definitely done something for her and she's doing great. She's great, she's great. I can't say anything more than that, she's great. She could not be better, honestly, she could not be better. You can't even notice that it happened. She's doing well in school. I feel really glad that I don't have to worry about it anymore. I just feel glad that it's over and I don't have to have surgery for that ever again. We interviewed Clara 17 days after she had surgery. You would have never known she went through this kind of procedure. Good news, pathology res results showed the lesion was benign. Joining us is Clara's plastic surgeon, Thomas Sampson, and also plastic surgeon, Dino Ravnik. Thank you both for being here. What an incredible story to think that she it was through the orthodontist. How common are these lesions in children? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, these, these kinds of lesions are um, very uncommon in the general population. Uh, being at Penn State Health, we uh, get a fair amount of referrals from the mid-state, which is the reason that we're able to uh, see many more of these kinds of cases. And, and uh, essentially, over the course of a year, we'll probably do about 10 to 15 of these types of surgeries. And Dr. Sampson, what are the long-term implications of using 3D printed implants in patients? The 3D printing has really changed the way we, we reconstruct these. We used to use the patient's own uh, skull, which would require a much bigger incision, a much bigger surgery, bigger uh, recovery, and with not the same kind of uh, consistent results. So using the 3D printed um, implants, we're able to get the patients back to work, to school, to play, uh, with long-lasting results that uh, truly should stand the test of time. And we certainly saw that in Clara's case. Yeah. Now, as we're talking about bioprinting, this really involves you, Dr. Ravnik. Talk to us about your lab and the futures that you hold there. Yeah, so as plastic surgeons, our job are, is to re, really reconstruct all types of uh, defects that are caused by cancer or congenital defects or trauma, for example. And as plastic surgeons, we're trained basically in the, in the principle that we try to use um, extra tissue to restore those defects. Our lab really focuses on using excess tissue as spare parts to retrieve the cells, typically adult stem cells, that we uh, potentially hope to be able to use as bioing for the printing process with the idea of um, building tissues and organs in the lab eventually in the future for a customized uh, replacement for the patient. Wow, how exciting is that? And Dr. Sampson, what other cases in clinical situations would you use this same type of implant? Yeah. 
So this type of uh, 3D printed implant can be used in uh, trauma situations uh, where great segments of the skull have been lost. Uh, cancer patients who have lost uh, uh, large portions of very difficult uh, contoured, uh, as in these cases, uh, the 3D printing allows us to get, again, a custom implant that matches perfectly to the opposite side. And when it's done, as in, in Clara's case, you would never be able to tell that anything was actually done. And that's the goal. Okay, and Dr. Rabinick, we have time for one quick viewer question that came in. It, and it says, with the advancements in 3D printing, can this technology be used for correcting congenital defects or for vessel replacements? Yeah, and it's, a, it's actually a technology in, in progress. It continues to be developed. And our really our pillars are using um, the manufacturing technique of 3D printing, which we do with our collaborators at University Park, but also advances in, in cell biology and surgical and microsurgical techniques to integrate all these components. Uh, and it really can be applied to really any of those conditions that you mentioned. Okay, lots of really great information. Thank you both for being here with us tonight. And we also want to thank you, our viewers, for sharing your stories and sending in your questions. If you would like more information or if you would like to schedule an appointment with Hershey Medical Center, call 1-800-243-1455 or visit online at hmc.pennstatehealth.org. Thanks for watching tonight. We wish you good health.